At 2.11 p.m. on December 9, 2019, White Island, a stratovolcano in New Zealand's Bay of Plenty, erupted at the worst possible moment, spewing ash 12,000 feet into the air and pushing a wave of hot ash, rock, and acid across the crater floor. The volcano released an enormous amount of pressure that had been building over time. And, as is typical of Mother Nature, it did so in blatant disregard for the 47 people touring the small island at the moment of eruption. Uh, I think I know where this is going. Oh, it's a disaster. I'm so intrigued. Uh, just wait, it gets worse. We are just the masters of disasters, aren't we? Calamity Janes. Welcome back to Calamity Janes podcast. I'm Bailey. I'm Madison. And today I wanted to start off the episode with something that I found on the interwebs. It's actually a callback to a previous episode we did on Apollo 13. I think it's... The third episode we did? Yes. Is that right? Yes. So if you want to go give that a listen, here's a little factoid that I found on the internet. And Madison, you might have seen this because you also, turns out, are on the internet a lot. But I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Did you know that the woman who helped create the abort system that rescued the Apollo 13 astronauts is Jack Black's mom? And when she was in labor, she took an engineering problem with her to the hospital, solved it, called her boss, and then gave birth. I did see that. To Jack Black. I know. What a, she's a celebrity. What? I know. She is incredible. I did see that. And I, I saw it after we recorded the episode. But incredible. I want to know everything there is to know about her. Truly. Well, you can go to... I'll link this in the show notes, but there's a Snopes article because I was like, there's no way this is, I mean, maybe it's like a half truth. No, sure enough, this whole Snopes article goes point by point, talking all about it, talks about who she was, um, what her background was, and she's just, she seems like an amazing person, so smart and so driven. I love it. I want to meet her, to know her, to love her. All of it. Same Z's. So that's our little callback to Apollo 13. Fun fact. Go give that episode a listen, but only after we talk about what what are you telling me about today, Moo? The White Island volcanic disaster. We haven't oh, I guess we have done a volcano. But a little bit. Not a recent volcano. Yes. Do you remember hearing about this at all? Um is this was there a boat involved? In yes. and smoke? Okay, yes. Then kind I do of, yeah. recall some vague details. Okay, good. Well, uh, that's great. Otherwise, this would be really boring for you. No, no. Since when has rehashing a disaster that we have both agreed is a horrific disaster ever boring? It's so true. It's we could talk. I point. mean, yes. Well... Let's get our bearings, shall we? So, refreshing our memory of Earth science, a stratovolcano or composite volcano is a conical volcano composed of many layers of hardened lava. These volcanoes typically have a steep profile with a summit crater or a collapsed crater at the summit called a caldera. So, these volcanoes are known for their magma, uh, or sorry, scratch that. These eruptions are not known for their magma, more so for their explosiveness. So Krakatoa and Vesuvius were stratovolcanoes. Interesting. So are, and they're explosive because they have that cooled caldera in the middle, basically like a plug? Well, they might. all the pressure? The, a caldera is just a collapsed crater at the summit. So Mm -hmm. these are just uh, enormous pressure or magma, like deep below the surface. Um, they're spewing hot gas. They're not making more, they're not spreading out by... Oh, it has to do with what they're actually putting out into the world and not about their structure. Yes. I see. Yeah. Um, well, it's a little bit of both, but yeah. So think, um, less of like lava flows and more of, uh, pyroclastic eruptions. Or pyroclastic flows, sorry. Do you know what that is? What's a pyroclastic versus a lava? I thought they were the same thing. Uh, a pyroclastic flow is hot air and or like hot gas. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So when you think about Vesuvius, they that town or town city wasn't covered in lava. It was covered in ash, and those people were mm. burned alive because of the like superheated gas that gushed and like swept across the volcano and through the town. 
I don't think I knew that. Oh, well, we'll cover that but one later, too. But it makes sense. Because when they find people, they're people, and they're they're not, I mean, yeah, exactly. if they're covered in magma, you wouldn't find the people, right? Yes, that is exactly right. Uh, so, now, now that we clumsily got that out of the way. <laughs> we we muddled through, we and we learned something new. I learned something new. Excellent. At, at one point in time, my knowledge of volcanoes was much more extensive than it is now, but that is what a uh, an education change looks like, I suppose. You didn't talk much about volcanoes in law school? Uh, no. No, I did not. I Sad. barely talked about volcanoes in the one geology class I took. There's a lot to be said about geology. Volcanoes don't get all the glory. Uh, I know, but they should. They're so cool. True. So... Like an iceberg, most of White Island's mass is underwater. To many, the island may not look as threatening as Krakatoa or Vesuvius. White Island has erupted many times in recent history, though. Most notably, a new crater was formed from an eruption in 2000, and eruptions were reported in 2012, 2013, and 2016. So it's an active little guy. It's got plans. It's got meetings. It's got, it's brunching. It's okay. Yes, exactly. So when you see, uh, if, if you were to Google White Island, you're going to see all the videos that people took of this. I'm Googling it. Oh, please do. You're going to see the 2019 eruption, which was huge, massive, crazy. But the island is basically always steaming. It's it has an acid lake. It has like boiling mud pits. It's really beautiful. It's like a okay. You just described a hellscape. That doesn't sound beautiful at all. I mean, imagine the conditions of hell. That's what this volcano's <laughs> like. It's gorgeous. If you fine, whatever. To each their own. I don't know. At one point in time, you would have gotten you like gotten a astrophysics hard on for a black hole or something. <laughs> I still don't want to go to a black hole. <laughs> I, I don't care to go visit well, a black hole. I'm not saying I want to go here either. Okay. It sounds a little bit like it. <sighs> Absolute paradise. The oh steam, God. the hot gas. Oh, I love it. All right. You know. That's what, that's you. That's my impression of you. Moving on. Okay. The 2016 eruption occurred mercifully at night, but experts knew then that had anyone been on the island, that there would have been very little chance of survival. Uh, oh, mercifully, because there were no tourists. This yes. is not like an inhabited, which makes sense. I'm looking at pictures right now, and it doesn't look like it is inhabitable. No, it's not. Like, the what is above the water is essentially the, the crater, or at least there is not much of the island that is not the crater. Above I see. Water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you, I would encourage anyone to go look at pictures and I'll talk about some of the resources that I really enjoyed or found really helpful. But they, uh, if you look at a picture of this, it looks like some mountains kind of peeking up above the water. And then once you get a little bit closer, it's very obviously a crater, but towards the edge of the water, I think on the south side, oh God, I hope, I think it's on the southern side of the island, there's a jetty where uh, the boats will send like a small, the tour boats, like large tour boats or the catamarans will send a small inflatable raft for tourists to get up to the jetty so they can take like a really easy walk straight up to the crater. People are walking, so I was just about to ask, what does one do when they are touring what is literally just a volcano in the middle of the water they just get there they it's a really interesting habitat um obviously there are no animals or anything on the island but there is some in some of the videos or pictures that you can see prior to this eruption there was some vegetation growing on the outskirts of it but because of the chemicals coming out of the earth it they're like rainbow colors they're Ooh. Yeah, it's like really, it really people should look at these videos. It's fascinating. But you can, they said it's a pretty easy hike. I can't remember exactly how long it is, but you're spending like two hours out on the island. Like you dock sort of at this jetty. You take this easy walk up to the crater acid lake and you kind of take some pictures. They give people gas masks because the air is kind of toxic. Once you get close enough, it's hot. There are steam vents, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what 
it looks like. What do people do when they go visit a volcano? This yes. particular volcano, it's a pretty easy walk up to the acid crater lake. There are steam vents. There are boiling mud pits. There are sights. There are sounds. There are smells. It's interesting. Ta-da. Sorry, did you say acid mud pit? Acid crater lake. And then at, oh. they, uh, I watched a documentary, well, a 60 Minutes about it, if we can call that a documentary, but it was really well done. Uh, they talk about at one point with an eruption, there were like bubbling mud pits. And it's, okay, you can wipe that look off your face because it's interesting and you're going to offend the only volcanologist or geologist that might listen to us. So you can just stop that. You know what I think of when I hear volcanologist is actually Vulcan? Yeah, me too. Um, not <laughs> volcano. <laughs> I think the exact same thing, which is so why I, I think they're so cool. <laughs> yeah, a scientist with the ears. <laughs> uh, I wish. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we back now? Are you ready? We're back. Okay. So leading up to the eruption on December 9th of 2019, there was unrest on White Island. In October of that year, what's that look? Do you know? Are you okay? I'm okay. I just, when you said unrest, I was envisioning people, not the actual island. There the are island no was... people there. Well, apparently there are sometimes. There are sometimes people there. There are no inhabitants. There are tourists. Quit for the love of Pete. Would you listen to the story? And I am. I'm just, I'm trying to skepticism. actively listen. Ugh. I'm actively listening. I'm trying to, it, I'm painting a picture in my mind with your words. So when you say there's unrest at the island... I'm thinking that, like, people are brawling or something. There is geothermal unrest on the island. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. Yes. In October of 2019, there were tremors. Only in that voice. You can only continue in that voice. <laughs> there were tremors. <laughs> the tremors. <laughs> there were tremors and sulfur dioxide was at its highest since the 2016 eruption. A month later, on November 18th, the volcanic alert level for White Island was raised to a level two. That goes from zero to five, but three is the highest it can be without an eruption. So even though two is like technically middle of the ground, it is very high for a not actively erupting volcano. Okay, so it's like... Mm, I really wish... I'm better with color scales, if I'm being honest. It's like a yellow... Not quite an orange and yeah. certainly not a red is what I'm seeing. Yes. It indicates okay. moderate to heightened volcanic unrest. Okay. And then, so that was November 18th. On November 24th, a 5.9 magnitude earthquake lasting one minute with an epicenter 6.2 miles or about 10 kilometers away from White Island was recorded. Ooh, foreboding. And that's not a small volcano. Yeah. That is exactly right. Uh, Sorry, earthquake. It's no small earthquake is what yeah, I meant to say. That is correct. See see how I just let that slide because everyone understood what happened? It's uh, exactly what you didn't do with the Mars-Moon mix-up. I let you know right away you were very wrong. <laughs> I know. Anyways. <laughs> so going back to December 9th. Uh, Ovation of the Seas, a cruise ship owned by Royal Caribbean, offered a tour of the volcano through White Island Tours as a daytime excursion. 38 passengers from Ovation of the Seas took this opportunity. In total, White Island Tours had about 100 passengers booked to visit the volcano that day, requiring three of their four boats. Mm. Yes, much people. Many, many human. Uh... That was really cringy. Don't put that in there. That was I'm bad. putting that in. Okay. I like it. I'm putting it in. Volcanic Air, another tour company, was scheduled to send two helicopters to White Island that day. The tour companies staggered their tours so as not to crowd the island with one tour leaving as another one arrived. As the first tour boat was leaving and leaving the island and sailing northeast for one last photo op, the first volcanic helicopter left as well, leaving one chopper... <laughs> I say chopper. Who do I think I am? Leaving one helicopter with a guide. The chopper. <laughs> Leaving one helicopter with a guide and his four guests. At 2.10 p.m., a GeoNet camera scheduled to take photos of the crater every 10 minutes captured a group of 21 tourists calmly and pleasantly meandering back to the dock. 
from the acid crater lake. This was the last photo of all but three of them. Mm, that doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. It doesn't. Uh, as a quick aside, if this were a much longer podcast or a series or something, I would go into this a little bit more. But through the resources that I found about what happened here, there are really incredible heroic and like enduring stories from the people who are on the island, people who are trying to help. I would really love to go into some of them. It, it, it would go on so, so long if we did this. But I would really encourage people to check out the links where I found all this information because they're fascinating, incredible stories. Can you just tell us like one person's incredible story? Um. Okay, so the pilot of the... I think that was it. Hang on. I'm trying to remember exactly. End of the story. <laughs> the pilot. <laughs> the pilot. There was a pilot. He was there. Uh, there was... I'm trying... Oh, okay. There was one. So in the 60 Minutes... I think it's uh, New Zealand 60 Minutes on YouTube. If you just search on YouTube, White Island Volcano Disaster, it's the first thing to pop up. It's like 34 okay. minutes. It's amazing. You should watch it. Uh, there was a family two daughters and their dad that were on this tour and they were all they were in that group of 21 that was coming back from the crater right when it exploded and one of the daughters survived and she suffered burns to like 90 percent of her body Mm. or something but she tells uh, like what it was like what happened and her phone was recording the entire time wow So, but she talks about how, you know, it happened so fast, she could see that her skin was falling off and it was excruciating, you know, she couldn't breathe. But she said her dad also survived the eruption initially and she could barely see, she could barely breathe, but she, every like 20 or 30 minutes or so, he would call out her name to make sure that she was still alive and still awake. And unfortunately her sister passed away, but she was eventually rescued. And so was her dad. And he, uh, and her dad survived for a month in hospital until he passed away from his injuries. But it's just comforted his daughter, daughter the whole time. Oh my gosh. I know I was tearing up as she was talking about this. And then, and her, they were all on ovation of the seas. Their mom, I believe was back on the cruise ship or doing something else. So, and so then she's talking about after her father and her sister, they were on this cruise ship celebrating her sister's 21st birthday. And so she was talking about how the thing that she misses the most is the humor in the house and how they just got to be around each other. And I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) Is Yeah. And there are stories of other people who weren't as close to the eruption, who survived initially, who tried to help other people. And that's what cost them their life. Like, really, everyone, Mm -hmm. all of the people who were on or near the volcano worked together to help they really did like it's it's truly an amazing thing that they all tried to do Mm -hmm. so i would really encourage people to look at some of these resources because i couldn't do it justice either but they're um that 60 minute episode and then outside online has a very moving and detailed article about the victims that i highly recommend as well and that'll go into a lot more of like the culture of um like new zealand as well and how that impacted this Anyways. I mean, think about that. You're, like, you're, it's not, as a human, you are up against this unimaginably big force in the earth, and they make the choice to help and not run? What? Yeah, there, and we'll get into this a little bit later, because the whole rescuing that happened here, it did not go how it was supposed to. And, and no, it doesn't. But, uh, it. It, it should definitely be known, though, that the tour guides and all of the passengers on the boats, like everyone who was in the imme- immediate vicinity of the volcano, really rose to the occasion. So, uh, back to the story. Those on the island during the eruption described black smoke billowing up from the crater and a loud and sudden cracking noise like a tree snapping in half. Volcanologists think the eruption started... With a rise in magma from fault movement deep below, this was given more upward force by gases exsolving out of the magma as it rose and depressurized. 
Once the magma hit the acid crater lake, the water flashed into gas and the magma flashed into glass. Ste- oh. Yeah. There were also projectiles in in this eruption. Violence. That volcano chose violence. That yes. Day. So steam and ash shot 12,000 feet into the air and a pyroclastic flow of hot rock, ash, and acid gas blew across the crater floor where the tourists were walking. So that uh, woman who survived uh, that I was just talking about, she described being kind of thrown like end over end by the force of it. And there, it wasn't just burns that people were suffering from. It was also, they talked about head wounds and they were battered. Well, yeah, because it sounds like you're catapulted away. You're not, yeah. you're not knocked to your butt and, you know, like that's that. It sounds like they were flung. Yes. By the yeah. force of air, toxic acid air. Yes, exactly. Those that were closer to the dock on the island scrambled to safety. Some leapt into the water and attempted to swim out to the tour boat, while others gathered on the dock in an excruciating daze, waiting for the dinghy or like the little rubber boat to take them out to the larger tour boats. The tourists closest to the crater could only lay there with charred skin and burning lungs, praying for rescue to come. Mm, how many people in like died on impact like how many did how many people survive the initial blast i'm not completely sure of the 21 uh that were closest to the i think uh, it's kind of hard to keep track of everyone because these numbers also change so i would look at some mm-hmm. articles and it was a little hard to keep track but mm-hmm. of the 21 that were closest to the crater i believe 19 passed Oh, wow. So it was instantaneous for many. Yeah. For the vast majority of them, it happened really quickly or like right after. Um, But they still tried. They still went, rescuers still went right back up to the crater. Of course. You you have to. You you have to do what you can. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So they, in uh, that 60 minute episode, they describe how they were, those that were closer to the water, so not at the crater, were they were taken by surprise as well but they were also incredibly burned they were also Mm -hmm. like dealing with horrific injuries it was it was just awful it was terrible for everyone and you can see at that boat that was leaving that all the videos that you'll find are from this boat that can like see the big view of the eruption and they circle back to go help and there are pictures of the people and it looks like if you didn't look at it closely and see they're covered in ash and they're like blackened limbs if you just saw it you'd be like oh there are people patiently waiting to get on this dinghy but people were just like dazed they were shocked they like couldn't fathom their injuries yet either Mm -hmm. and what else were they gonna do besides wait i mean it's how excruciating yeah well they said that some of the uninjured people were like pushing past them to get in the dinghy and they were like we're just standing there like what what can we do and one guy there was a couple who was there on their honeymoon i think they were the only two americans that were involved and they were describing how the man uh, sorry the husband was describing how he was like i went to climb down the ladder to get into the dinghy and my hand slid off because my skin fell off and like i couldn't hold on to the ladder because i didn't have skin anymore oh I, my- yeah yeah i know we're probably not looking to get too incredibly graphic in this but that is that's the reality of being involved in a volcanic eruption it's horrific an intensely hot hell on earth yeah literal hell on earth so what happens next is both inspiring and infuriating so like i said that first tour boat immediately turned back they first try to outrun the cloud because they they don't know completely what's going on um But they go back and they start picking up survivors on the dock. Passengers, once they get people onto their boat, they would put their own clothing on top of the victim's exposed skin. And, Mm -hmm. or I guess they have no skin. What do you do? Well, because I don't know, is that worse? You are missing your protective barrier that is your skin. So do you need that? But what happens if it gets sticks to you and oh my god that I, sounds horrific i know i know they so they would put their clothes on top of their arms or their legs anything that was exposed well and they even said you would look at people and their clothes were perfectly intact but if you'd lift their shirt up they like everything was charred 
And what? Yeah, it's it's bizarre. And so they would put their own clothes on top of this charred skin and then pour fresh water on top of it to try to act as like mm. a second more hydrating mm-hmm. skin. Um, but so this this boat ride, though, th- from the volcano back to the mainland, it's 90 minutes. Oh, it's mm. 90 minutes of turbulent waters, whipping wind, sea, sea salt coming at you. It's it's not fun on a good day. Yeah. You're like, I'm doing this annoying boat ride to get out to this marvelous ecosystem. It's not what I want to be doing ever. Exactly. And there are pilots who typically give helicopter tours of the island. They noticed the eruption and they were like, let's go. They immediately get into two different helicopters and they're out there. And it's a 20-minute ride by helicopter. Um, A pilot from a a third tour company, uh, also, they did the exact same thing. So there are three helicopters of civilians Mm -hmm. going out to the island. They see this volcanic eruption. They know that there are tourists out there and they're not thinking twice about what they should do. They're, They're there. In total, they brought back 12 survivors in their three helicopters. What? They were walking through a foot of hot ash and acid air. They were trudging through that. They were carrying people on their own into their helicopters with nothing but a first aid kit, not knowing if there would be another eruption. They were out there doing it. That is incredible. It's it's amazing. Jiminy Cricket. Uh, those mm-hmm. heroes. Exactly. Now, what makes this so horrible is that... That wasn't it? No. That wasn't all of it? Uh, Well, uh, what makes the rescue portion of this so horrible is that New Zealand's emergency services deemed a rescue operation to the island too dangerous, leaving those that were left there or those that were already on the island to die. Despite reports from those pilots who flew in saying, it's okay, we just need help. I was going to say, yeah, you have people on the ground who are doing it and who can tell you firsthand, no man, pretty cool. Not pleasant, but we can do this. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, they were pushing through a foot of hot ash. They were not, I mean, they weren't there for the eruption, obviously, but they're also risking their lives to mm-hmm. to pull these people Braving out. some elements. Exactly. Um, so, and that's been a major point of contention in this whole thing is why if it's your job to go rescue why are you not going to rescue right so it was another it was two and a half hours until the first emergency services personnel went to the island well and who's making that call not even just it being your job what are what are the qualifications for determining whether or not rescue is feasible yeah. Well, and those might need to be reevaluated based exactly. on Exactly. And in that 60 Minutes episode, she is asking the man who made this call, she interviews him and is straight up like, why? If you had three people on the ground telling you what it was like, why did you not trust them? Mm-hmm. And he kind of dances around it, but ultimately says, knowing what we know now, yeah, we would have gone out there, but we didn't know what at the time. I'm like, again. You have people telling you. Exactly. But you're... And it's your job. It's Mm -hmm. (sighs) so, yeah. So that's a really big, that's a really big deal. Um, It's awful. Of the 47 people on the island, five were killed, 34 were injured and rescued, and eight were missing and presumed dead. Three others later died in the hospital and six more bodies were found during a recovery operation on the island. Over the next month, the death toll rose to 21, 19 of whom were passengers on the ovation of the seas. One man died the following summer, bringing the death toll to 22. Of the 12 that were rescued by helicopter, 10 did not survive. Mm. They recovered them. Yeah, yeah, And they had hope, right? Because to be injured so badly, and then if you were just left there, right? No no hope that anyone would Mm -hmm. help you. You're just... There. Yeah, exactly. Um, this was also a really disturbing factoid that I got from that outside online article. In order to treat the burns of the survivors, New Zealand had to issue a global order for the equivalent of 16 bodies worth of skin for grafts. Oh, I never would have thought to order 
back grafts by the body, but it would make sense if you're like almost entirely burned. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it does, random does graft skin have to come from a living human? Can you get it from a cadaver or like how how does that happen? That's a great question. I'm not hmm. sure. Uh I I truly don't know. I'm I don't know. Huh. Cuz I know I've seen, you know, in on just one person where it's like they need a section of their own skin. Mhm. Like I'm whole... not sure if if you could take it from a cadaver and initiating blood flow from the survivor mm-hmm. is all you need. I don't know. I can't mm-hmm. even begin to speculate about what that's like because I... We are not doctors. Disclaimer. No. <laughs> we are not medical professionals. And they needed how many? Six, Sixteen. 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 One six. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's it's all terrible. As you can imagine, there are lawsuits involved. Naturally. People are angry that Royal Caribbean didn't explain the risks of this tour to them. They're upset that rescue was left to Good Samaritans. They're upset that all they were really told to do was wear closed-toed shoes. Uh, the These lawsuits are still playing out right now, and New Zealand has very different like personal injury laws than we do. Mm. Um, in fact, I saw somewhere that they had outlawed personal injury claims. Um, what? yeah, I, I did not look too heavily into this because there are so many lawsuits mm-hmm. going on. Um, yeah, so those are still playing out right now and COVID delayed a lot of things too. So, oh, I'm sure. uh, so I don't have too many updates on those, but in the 60 minutes episode, the, that woman, who survived and her father and sister passed away, she, her lawyer um, is interviewed and talks about how they, no one explained to them the risks of this. And, you know, a bunch of people are also saying, so you're going to a volcano and you think it's safe or like you're going to what you know is an active volcano and you think it's okay. But so it sparks a really interesting discussion about adventure tourism in general. Mm Mm-hmm. And it makes you realize with with any sort of adventure tourism or just n- nature tourism, how much, how up to nature so much of that is, right? Yeah. Like there is only so much a company can do to prevent you from injury, natural disaster, whatever, you know? Yeah. It, what are you going to say? Why didn't you prevent the volcano from going off that day? I mean, not that it's... I'm not trying to say that it's it would be wrong to um, file a lawsuit because I don't know what the what the crew said about the volcano at all. I'm just saying being in like when Andrew and I went to Belize and we went to the the cave with the what's her name, the crystal maiden. Mm -hmm. um, And when we're they're very well trained guides, only a certain number of guides can do this. But but when you're in it and you're doing it, you're like. You can be as well trained as you want to. If a disaster happens here, it's it's up to nature, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. Exactly. Well, and I think what their their biggest thing is that they weren't told that they weren't told until they were already on the island doing the tour that the uh, the level had been raised to a two. Oh, yeah. They. Because when you think of, but I bet when you were doing that tour, you weren't thinking I something horrible might happen today. You might you might have been thinking, oh, I might slip. Um, I might get me personally. <laughs> yes, one hundred percent. Um, the, there could be a flash flood, and yeah. all of a sudden, my head's poking out of the water right now. But no part of me will be poking out of the water, and we're all going to drown. Those thoughts constant. I just live with those all the time, though. So it's like, yeah, okay, well. that's a really good point. Did you, what they're trying to say, what a bunch of people are trying to say is, you know, you went to an active volcano, you assumed this risk, but all the people who were on it were like, yeah, but we thought if we didn't step in the acid lake, if we didn't stray from the path, like we didn't think they would take us to something that could explode while we were on it. Or that there's a certain threshold, like that authorities scientists have established between like a safety threshold where there's some buffer between what is definitely certainly safe and what is 
definitely guaranteed catastrophic. Yeah, exactly. Because the guides were saying, you know, we've been here at at a level two before. Nothing has happened. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, this uh, that woman who was being interviewed was saying, I was getting nervous because our guide said was getting jumpy was saying, you know, let's speed this up a little bit, like take a picture and let, let's head on out of here. Like, I don't want to be here very much longer. And she's like, so um, obviously they're nervous too. Right. We, yeah, that's pretty, pretty good evidence that that's not the safest time to be there. Well, yeah. Had it been at a, a zero or a one and this happened, then no, no, I, I, people might still be having this conversation, but I don't think it would be quite as controversial. But because they took them... Uh, it had just been elevated to they had just had this earthquake not very long before it's but it's a money making opportunity how many days before this was that earthquake um i think it was 2 weeks yeah on november oh, two weeks. 24th was the earthquake and then it was december 9th when this happened yeah i mean it seems like foreshadowing but as someone who is not a geologist or a Earthquakeologist, size seismologist. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I don't know what um, what the timeline from earthquake to. Oh yeah, exactly. And it's easy for us to say in hindsight, but they likely mm-hmm. had two weeks of tours right after that that were totally fine. And mm-hmm. it's a a lot of it is just awful luck. But people are saying, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing stuff like this. Maybe this is nature telling us. This is not okay. We cannot keep going to these places that we're not supposed to be. But there will always be someone who's like, nah, I'm going. Yeah. Well, and it's it's fun. Just like when you go skydiving, you're like, okay, this is a good company. These people do this several times every single day, but there's an element of risk to it that you really like and that draws you to it. But you don't actually think you're going to die, even though no. the risk is there. I mean, I do. I would never be caught skydiving because I would be the one person who definitely did die from yeah. skydiving. But well, I in think this theory, every time I get on a plane. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know why I don't. It's, yeah. Hmm. But that is the discussion about uh, adventure tourism that's going on right now. Uh, I I don't think they're they're currently doing tours of White Island right now. It's actually owned. It's privately owned. Um, oh, yeah. Someone owns a volcano. Yeah, I at least that's what I saw is that it was owned. Uh, I think by two brothers, and so there there are lots of people who could be found at fault. But right now, Royal Caribbean is being sued for first of all not informing passengers of the risks and then they did not communicate well with the families on the boat um who had loved ones that were on the island Mm. yeah very villainous of two people to own a a volcano i know right god i hope i'm right in saying that i would have sworn that i the second documentary that i watched i'm pretty sure that's what they said uh yeah it's it's all It's all terrible. So I don't really have a very profound ending for this one. But I did think that the whole thing was, had no one been on the island, no one would have cared because it's a relatively small volcano, relatively small eruption. It's just that 47 people had the worst day of their lives. Yeah. And it's like too recent to see any progress in terms of changes, whether that's thresholds for safety or changes in disclosures from tourist tourism companies mm-hmm. mm. but probably for the best that they paused put pump the brakes on the visitors yeah well thank you for telling me about the white island volcano eruption um, anytime very sad very sad please for the love of everyone pick something a little more upbeat next week can do Definitely. With, like, a conclusion that's, like, and even though this horrible thing happened, people's lives weren't lost in vain or, you know, people weren't injured because we learned X, Y, Z. Okay. I would just like to say up until this point, I had been doing that. I'm sorry that the, you know what, we're all just Not really. The last volcano, the last volcano one you covered was also, like, "Mm," and then the Roman Empire fell. Whoops. Okay. That was... In, True. Uh, Spot the lie. All right. 
Are you just trying to tell me how to do my job? I'm telling you what the people, <laughs> me, want. I know. Give us a break. I'm sorry. Okay. It'll get lighter next week. I'll try to... Hey, Apollo 13 was pretty light. It was. That was not last week. That was two weeks ago. What was last week again? Um, The Karen Gorn mountaineering disaster. Oh, yeah. Karen Gorn. I literally had a disclaimer in that episode that said I will not be able to string together those <laughs> vowels and consonants in the way they should be. Disclaimer again here. Sorry. So sorry. It's not my intention to offend. Bring something upbeat next week. Okay. Follow the assignment. Fine. I'll do my best. Thank you so much. Well, that's it from us, everyone. <laughs> now, for our final act, Madison, please apologize. I'm so sorry. Please tune in next week. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>